Welcome to worship at North Raleigh Presbyterian. We have people still coming in, so I'm going to try to give us a, a little bit of, uh, of an, welcome and announcements to get us started. Um, and uh, welcome those of you that are joining us on the live stream. I apologize we're starting late, but it takes a little while to get everybody in here. So this is a great problem to have. It's very exciting to see everyone. So welcome to worship. If you're a guest, we especially welcome you. And boy, did you pick a good day to join us because we're having, um, this is our homecoming day. So there are lots of activities on the campus, um, including this worship service today. After worship, we have um, activities there. Um, we're celebrating our past, present, and future. So if you want to talk a little bit about our past, they're doing recordings um, in the sanctuary, and you are welcome to go to the sanctuary um, to do some recordings about things that have happened, stories about our past history. If you want to know about what we're doing now, those are there are tables that are all along the sidewalk on the other side of the Faith Ministries building here um, that talk a little bit about different activities, um, committees, ministries that you can participate in. Um, and those are, um, that's our present. And then if you want to know a little bit more about the future, um, you're going to go to the Faith Ministries building and Andy James, who's going to talk to you uh, um, later on in the service, um, will be there to answer some questions about our Holy Cow um, assessment tool. Um, we are also having lunch, pig picking, yum, and macaroni and cheese and coleslaw, and I'm sure there are other things that I don't even know about. Um, wanted to let you remind you, those of you that attend Max, that that's starting back up this week at 545 on Wednesday. And uh, for those of you that are incoming officers, your workbooks are in your mailbox. Um, so you want to pick those up today if you're here. And if you're not here, come on in the, in the blue mailbox. Oh, in the blue mailbox, excuse me, in the blue mailbox, which is outside of the FMB here um, in the back. And uh, pick those up so that you're ready for your training when it starts soon. Um, so I, don't, I think that takes care of all of our major announcements. And uh, let's prepare our hearts for worship.
Please join me in the call to worship. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. God's love is our foothold, which shall not be moved. God's word is our wellspring, our fount of living water. Let us worship God who offers us wisdom. Our call to worship was from the first psalm, written sort of as an introduction to all of the wisdom that was to come in all of the psalms collected there in our scripture. And Psalm 1 encourages us and draws us in and perhaps even gives us the promise of baptism, that God's righteous ones are like trees planted by streams of water, trees that yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. Friends, baptism is God's promise of renewal regardless of what's true about our lives. While we confess, I'm going to bring you some waters of renewal and invite Brandon to come and lead us as we confess the truth about our lives, praying first in silence. confess together in one voice. God of wisdom, forgive our foolishness. We desire what we do not need and corrupt our relationships with envy. You urge us to wisdom and humility. We stir up conflict 
and seek our own ambitions and selfish gain. You call us to be pure, peaceable, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and truthful. Yet we revert to violence, anger, and argument. We ask again, forgive our foolishness. Give us your grace that we may harvest righteousness and peace. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In the and accepted, forgiven, and free. Thanks be to God. I run, and I gotta run off the sunny side. Oh, Y'all are forgiven and accepted and loved and all that stuff too. <laughs> I said it out of order so I can't even remember. Y'all need some baptism water up here. Be with you. Oh, friends, we are at peace with God at all times, in all ways, when we are at our best, and even when we are bad at our worst. Water do indeed renew us and revive us and remind us that we are at peace. And so we are free to start every relationship in a whole new way by sharing a word of peace with each other. Peace of Christ be with you all. So, share a word of peace. Y'all can get up, mingle just a little bit if you want to. No, please don't spray water on me. I'm not. I'm just going to bring it to you right there. <laughs> Here ends our live stream for the day. Oh, okay. It's with you. Our first lesson is a selection of sayings from Proverbs 31, starting at verse 10. In preparation for hearing God's word, let us pray. Faithful God, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sanctify us by your word and spirit so that we may glorify you in the company of the faithful. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Listen with me for what the spirit says. A capable wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. 
She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings, her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the city gates.
our New Testament lesson comes from James, the third chapter, starting at verse 13. Listen again to what God will say to us. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and you do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. From Proverbs 31 and from James's letter, this has been the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children to come on down and join me up front. Come on down. I'm kind of taking up a lot of the carpet here. Guys, come on down. Have a seat on the carpet. It's good to see you. It's kind of fun to have worship outside, isn't it? Especially when you can smell. You smell the good foods cooking. Yum. Hey, guys, you can sit on the carpet. You don't have to kneel down on the ground. It's okay. Hey, Zachary. Hi, Elliot. Come on in. Have a seat. Okay, I have a story to read you. It's from um, our, the gospel reading for today, all right? I'm the best. No, I'm the best. You are not. I am. Have you ever had an argument like that about who's the best? Yeah, or who's number one? Mm -mm. The disciples were arguing as they walked along the road. They did not know that Jesus could hear them. Why are you arguing, asked Jesus. What are you saying? The disciples' faces turned bright red. They looked down at the ground. No one said anything. They knew it was wrong to argue about being the best. Jesus stopped, sat down, and invited the disciples to sit down with him. He lifted a child onto his lap. If you want to be the greatest, Serve and help everyone else, Jesus told them. This child believes in God and can serve others. It doesn't matter how big or strong or smart or fast you are. Anyone can serve and help others if he or she tries. Then you are truly great. All right, can we remember that this week? It doesn't matter how big 
or strong or smart or fast you are. Anybody can serve God, and that makes you great. Sound good? All right. So what do we do when we end our time together? Yeah. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth and plant it deep within us. Shape and fashion us in your likeness. That the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Amen. I've never really liked going to bed. I guess a more specific way of saying that is that I've never liked trying to go to sleep. I've been this way for as long as I can remember. And if you ask me why, I'd say that I'm a night owl. Or now that I have a child, the late hours of each day are about the only time I can get some time by myself, and I need time by myself. And so most nights I stay up as long as I can until not even a movie or a book can keep my eyes open. The truth is, though, that I don't stay up late just because I'm a night owl or just because I want some time by myself. I am that, and I do want those things. But there's a deeper reason. Ever since I was a child, it was fear that made me stay awake at night. I used to be terrified of the dark. And my brothers, to this day, they give me a hard time about how lit up my room was growing up. I had a night light plugged into the wall, a sound machine that had this like crystal ball that sat on it and light shone through that onto the ceiling. I had those uh, glow-in-the-dark stars that stick on the ceiling or the wall and a lava lamp. Also, let's bring back lava lamps. <laughs> all of that, all of that light in a room that was not much bigger than this tent. And all that light brought me a little bit of comfort. But the fear was still just underneath the surface. Any little noise scared me. The darkness of the hallway outside my door scared me. And when I got scared, I called for my mom. And what she did in those moments, looking back, was so wise. She taught me to sing to myself. She taught me to sing in my head, quietly to myself, Jesus loves me. She taught me to sing Psalm 56.3 that says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. And as I got a little older, I stopped being afraid of the dark. But my fear, often like fear does, just morphed into something else. Some nights, I got panic attacks. I would stare at my window, and I would pray to see daylight. But the nights just seemed to drag on forever. And when I couldn't make it through this on my own, I'd wake my dad up. And my mom must have shared her wisdom with him, too, because he taught me to read psalms. Any psalm. It didn't matter. But he would sit and read to me, and I could feel my chest loosen up. feel like I could start breathing again. I still do it to this day. Fear just keeps morphing into other things. Sometimes when I lay down at night, something like an existential dread falls over me. I roll around thinking about Taylor 
my child, my soon-to-be child. All the kinds of worries fill my head. What's the world going to be like for them? What if they get hurt or get sick? How will I care for them? Those fears and worries fill my head. And when they do, I go back to my mom's wisdom. I sing to myself. I read psalms. I thought about that wisdom as I meditated on James' words in chapter 4. Draw near to God. Draw near to God. I think that's what my mom taught me. It's an invitation. There's no requirement or prerequisite. There's no agenda. There's no coercing or interfering or forcing. It's just an invitation in any situation to draw near to God. Whether you're a child who's scared of the dark, a teenager with anxiety, or an adult fearful of your families and probably even your own future, the invitation is all we need right there. Draw near to God. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. But it's not as if God is far away, although it can feel like that sometimes, right? It's okay to say that. It can feel like God's far away in the dark, in the darkness of night or maybe the dark night of the soul, in the middle of the pressure of being and becoming what your parents would want you to be. Or as we get older and realize just how little control we actually have over our lives. James doesn't promise us, though, that we will be spared from any of those things. He promises that God will draw near to us, and that is everything. Drawing near to God is a recognition, maybe more of a faith, however a small sliver of faith that you've got that God is already close to you. And if we have ears to hear it, it's a truth that the Spirit whispers in our hearts in every single situation. It happens at times, maybe you know what I'm talking about. It happens when our belief and love for God feel tired and worn out, like an old rag, something barely good enough to clean up our messes with. And our messes never really seem to be fixed Anyway, so what's the sense in believing? Like I said, God does not always feel close. And like the psalmist cries out, we cry out too sometime in the night. How long, O oh Lord, will you be so far away? Our lives are hard. God knows that's true. We work. We get sick, our loved ones die, marriage is hard, parenting's hard, growing up is hard. We get lonely, we fail, our bodies betray us, and there's pressure at school, at work, at home. And that's just a few of our personal struggles. If we started to name the societal struggles, we'd probably crumble under the weight of all of it. Loving God doesn't seem to fix any of those things, any of my problems. So what's the point? And it's in a moment like that, that out of the depths of your soul, parched and starved as it is, you hear, draw near to God. And it feels like you can breathe again, maybe. You realize that even if for a moment that God is already with you, God is already experiencing your pain and your struggles. That God already holds your worries and your anxieties for you. Those pressures for achievement and success and good grades and performance all of a sudden seem to be nothing but illusions. Draw near to God. Even with tired and worn out faith and love, draw near to God. Because James doesn't promise we're spared from any of the stuff, 
any of the stuff of living a life. He says, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you, is already near you. Or it happens when the anger and the frustration and maybe even the hatred we feel from the world, and if we're honest, for it, and the people who stumble around in it, it starts to creep into our hearts. Those times when we grow cynical and judgmental because the world is out to get us, so we better get it first. It's when we look at others with suspicion. We feel cornered, where every moment feels like you're bracing for a fight. And then the Spirit whispers, draw near to God. And it's then you realize that the world and the person you hate and even you just need a little bit more love. That with that invitation, draw near to me, the place in you where that anger and hatred come from can be let go. That maybe the whole reason any of us are here anyways is to find some communion with God and with one another. Or it happens. It happens when we're at work and the busyness of life is overwhelming. We're caught up striving for achievement and success, the admiration and the approval of other peoples and the satisfaction of a paycheck so that maybe we'll feel like we're of value for something to somebody. And then way down deep in our hearts, from places we'd ignored for so long we forgot that they existed, we hear a truth beyond any other truth. Draw near to God. And as foolish as it seems, we might say that that's the whole purpose of life. It's not acquiring or building or succeeding. It's as simple and unassuming as drawing near to God because God is drawing near to you is already near you. Maybe it happens on a day like today. You have come to church tens of thousands of times before. And when you dare to ask yourself why, the only answer that you can come up with is, because I always have. You put on the same shirt and tie, the same dress, sit in the same spot, and if we're honest, we have no clue why we're here. Maybe for the community, give my money to a good cause, have a place to be buried because my parents make me, maybe for some barbecue. You come to church, and you sit, and you say the same words over and over. Words said so often, they seem to not really mean anything anymore. Words like, and it's so funny, we heard them in a chopped up way this morning. You are loved and accepted, forgiven and freed. And they just seem like words. No more consequential than good morning. Almost nonsensical. What's in your head is the hundred different things you have to do today. And the million things for school you haven't started. Or even that this whole thing about Jesus seems to be a bit bogus anyway. But then in the silence of these same old, same old worship services through the fog of all the things you're thinking about. You hear. Draw near to me. Draw near to God. And you realize that that right there must have been the reason you're here anyway. Maybe the whole reason you're alive. Draw near to God. It's in drawing near to God that James makes a connection with wisdom. And this wisdom, he describes, is just about as foolish as believing that God would want to draw near to any one of us. 
and yet here we are. It's a wisdom of humility and gentleness, purity and mercy. It's willing to yield to others. It's full of good fruit, sincere, without a trace of favoritism or partiality, and peaceable. It's the same wisdom Jesus shares with the disciples the same, from the story that, that the kids read down here. Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. Whoever wants to be great must become like a little child. It's impossible wisdom. Impossible without drawing near to God who is already near because it's the same God who became flesh in Jesus. And that is as near as it gets. So I wonder, as we go into a time where we will share stories about our past, learn about ways to engage in our present life and ministry, and then dream dreams of our future, how will you, how will we draw near to God? As you're going through homecoming, considering our past, present, and future, where do you hear God saying, draw near to me? Because it's in drawing near to God that we will see our past, our past, hmm. in all its beauty and all of its ugliness with a gentle wisdom that says, look at what God did. It's in drawing near to God that we will see our present and all of its fragility and its joy and its excitement with a wisdom that says, look what God is doing. And it's in drawing near to God that we can try to look at the future with all of its uncertainty and its hope with a wisdom that says I can't wait to see what God will do and we don't have to be afraid of nothing because draw near to God and God will draw near to you is already near you in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit Amen Affirmation of Faith is from the Confession of 1967. Let us say together what we believe. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of the human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals God's love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful humanity. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of God's love. Friends, let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, in our trouble and need, indeed, when we are afraid, we look to you. In abundance, when we are grateful and hopeful, we look to you. And as we pray, we pray that you would bless us again. So, God of abundant grace, hear our prayers. Head of the church, we pray for your church. Show us indeed what it means to be truly great. Show us that it is about serving others in the name of Christ 
that such greatness is about welcoming each person as your beloved child, God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the world. We pray that you would place your calling on strong and capable women and men everywhere. And then, oh God, that you would empower them to lead us and to lead all countries in your ways of wisdom and truth, that all people might flourish and thrive. God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. We pray, oh God, for this community. an end, O oh God, to the conflicts and disputes among us, arguments born of bitter envy and selfish ambition, and let us taste instead the fruits of righteousness and peace. God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for loved ones. We remember to you, O oh God, those who are struggling with difficult decisions or with deadly diseases. And we remember each one who grieves this day, praying that you would show each one your wisdom, your healing, and your deep joy. God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. Generous God, as you provide for us every day, nourish and strengthen us in faith and in faithfulness that we might share your grace in a world hungry for it. These things we pray through Jesus Christ, the bread of life and the one who has taught us to pray together and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's my pleasure to introduce the Reverend Andy James to you. Andy works with us through the Presbytery of New Hope. We are colleagues, spending a lot of time together in a lot of different ways. Yes. Thank you, Andy, for coming and interpreting Holy Cow to us and telling us about the cat um, as well as the cow uh, so that we can begin to envision our future. Thanks for being with us Absolutely. and plan to stay for barbecue. No, for sure. I, I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> Lisa and all of you, thank you for your warm welcome on this wonderful and warm day for your worship and celebration today. First, I want to bring you greetings on behalf of New Hope Presbytery. The over 300 ministers and 112 congregations of the Presbyterian Church USA, serving across 32 counties of Northeastern North Carolina, reaching from Eflund to Kill Devil Hills, from Roxborough to Newburn. And especially on behalf of our transitional executive presbyter and stated clerk, Vanessa Hawkins. All of us are so grateful for the ways that you support the work of the broader church through your pastors and other members who serve on our presbyteries committees, by hosting us for meetings and events, and by your faithful financial support of the presbytery and its mission. But I'm most excited today to be here to tell you a little bit more about the process that you'll be starting this coming week in the Holy Cow Congregational Assessment Tool, the CAT. 
This tool was originally created by a Presbyterian minister uh, about 25 years ago, and it's been used by thousands of churches of many different denominations as a way to learn more about themselves and to provide data-driven insights that can contribute to broader processes of discernment about the church's past, present, and future. About three years ago, our presbytery started encouraging our congregations to use this tool in times of transition and exploration and planning and change. And so we now provide resources and some trained people to help and support you in that work. You've probably been hearing about this work from your long range planning team over the last several weeks. And you probably on your way in saw that big picture of a cat outside the Family Ministries building. Beginning this week, you'll have the chance to complete a questionnaire that seeks your insights and input about the past, the present, and the future of North Raleigh Presbyterian Church. We hope that you will all take an opportunity to participate in this process. Once that is done, the individual responses will be run through Holy Cow's statistical analysis software. Then we will have two trained interpreters from the presbytery to come out and go over your results with your session, your pastors, and the long-range planning team. That's, in that two to three hour meeting, we'll walk together through that report and discuss the immediate insights that come from the responses and begin to explore how the information from that cat can inform your planning for the future. We'll also work together on preparing a summary of the insights that will be shared with the whole congregation. So this week, be on the lookout for more information from, about, from your long range planning team about how to participate in the assessment. I'll be around near the cat sign after worship today if you'd like to learn a little bit more or you have some questions for me. I'm so grateful to be a part of your celebration today and I look forward to learning with you about how God has been and will be at work in your life together. Thank you. And now as a sign of our discipleship, we will um, give thanks for our tithes and offerings and offer them up to God.
go out from this time of worship and draw near to God. My question is, what does that look like for you? I know what it is for me. What is God's way with you? Is it through prayer? Is it through scripture reading? Is it through being with others? I don't know what it is. But make it a matter of prayer. What is God's way with you to draw near to God? Because if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. God is already near you. Maybe even think about that as we go into this time of past, present, and future. Where do you see God working? Where's God worked in the past? Where's God working now? Where's God taking us in the future? Draw near to God. As you do that thing, may the love of God and the peace of Christ be with you, with those you love, and especially with those who no one loves. Amen. Thank you.